Hello and welcome to NDIS 10 Years. I'm Naz Campanella. Choice and control. That was the promise of a national disability insurance scheme designed to replace a patchwork of services scattered across states and territories. A system people with disability fought long and hard for. It's changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, including me. The NDIS was initially designed to support more than 400,000 people with disability at a cost of around $12.5 billion a year. Since then, costs have ballooned to $35 billion a year. Without changes, the scheme is predicted to cost $50 billion by 2026. Let's take a look at how we got here. Um, the fantastic work that it's taken you all to get here. 2012, the year the disability community's campaign to change a system many said was broken came to a head. Today I'm saying you've waited long enough. I am sometimes accused of being Dr No. When it comes to the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I am Dr Yes. There will be launches, not triumphs. Permanent care, not temporary help. Disability care starts in seven weeks' time and there will be no turning back. In 2013, four pilot sites were set up across the country. The Marbo moment of the disability sector and that is worth celebrating. <laughs> the problem is early reports show the NDIS is costing a lot more than anticipated going to keep to our election promises, but we're also going to make sure that we live within our means. In 2018, then Treasurer Scott Morrison scrapped plans to increase the Medicare levy to help fund the scheme. We just need certainty of funding, not for two years, not for four years, not for ten years. People's disabilities lives don't live and die around an election. Later that year, the Quality and Safeguards Commission was established. Every demand, every need that the NDIS has is fully funded in the budget. The NDIS has been underspent since its inception. So every single year that it's been running, it hasn't spent the funding uh, that it's been allocated. Each consecutive year it's actually gotten a lot more um, intense and a lot more anxiety provoking. By 2019, complaints of abuse in the NDIS were mounting. Flowers outside the home Anne-Marie Smith's late parents had built for her to live. Police believe she may have spent up to a year sitting in a chair in her Kensington Park home before her death. The nation wants answers, I want answers, uh, and we'll wait till the, uh, those investigations are complete. Amid the shock and grief, a reason for hope. The NDIS was fully adopted in 2020. A year later, more than 20 disability groups launched a campaign against the introduction of independent assessments. Which one's the flower? The proposal would have changed assessments for both eligibility and ongoing support. What the NDIS has done for him so far is amazing, but there's also the potential that will the independent assessors take all that from him. Independent assessments aren't designed uh, to remove funding. Indeed, they're designed to ensure that all Australians have an equitable access into the scheme. These planned reforms completely undermine the vision of the NDIS. So are independent assessments dead? Yes. This year, Treasurer Jim Chalmers announced a plan to trim costs by up to $15 billion over the next four years. Disabled people across Australia are seeing this cut as a stab in the back. Are we to deduce from this the federal government intends tightening eligibility for the NDIS? I think there's broad recognition uh, that changes need to be made in the NDIS. We're now joined by the Minister responsible for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Bill Shorten. Minister Shorten, thank you so much for joining us today. The NDIS is currently supporting almost 600,000 participants. How does that compare with the original plan that you were a key architect of and then later voted for? Well, I'm wrapped that the NDIS is changing lives. There's no doubt that in the journey of the last 10 years that we've discovered some unmet demand which just simply wasn't measured 10 years ago. 
In other words, the records and the systems were just missing certain people with profound disability. I think also there's been um, a retreat of services from other levels. So if you like, the NDIS in the last 10 years, because of its success, has become the only lifeboat in the ocean. So I think it's a combination of uh, undermeasuring initial demand, plus I think the uh, unintended consequence of the NDIS overshadowing other services that we now see perhaps slightly more people than we expected on the scheme. But it's changing lives and it's here to stay and I'm wrapped. The budget estimates say that the cost of the NDIS will reach $97 billion by 2032-33. You maintain the scheme is here to stay, but how can participants be sure mm. when those costs just keep rising? Well, first of all, I can be sure the scheme is here to stay because Labor is incredibly committed to it. We know that it's changing people's lives. Uh, it's allowing carers to go to work. It's giving adults with disability greater chance to participate in community to fulfil their own dreams and goals. We know that it's making a difference in the support for families and kids. So yes, I'm confident that it's here to stay. But I certainly agree that we need to make sure that every dollar that the scheme has is going to the people for whom it was originally designed. And I'm certainly also convinced that we need to eliminate the waste, some of the fraud. We need to have a longer term approach to people's plans, not just an annual ordeal. We also need to improve the capability of the agency to do better, to make better decisions, to make more transparent and empathetic decisions. We also need to make sure that the service providers, many of whom are great, but the, the, the shonkies are not treating people uh, on the scheme as almost human ATMs. You've said the NDIS needs a reboot. What exactly does that mean? And, and say, for example, does it mean changing eligibility for the scheme? Is that one of the things that the community needs to possibly brace for? I've got no doubt we need to clarify eligibility. I've got no doubt we need to look at uh, what we're doing with services outside the scheme. I've got no doubt we need to look at how do we help do better early screening of kids for their developmental delays. But this is all about the best interests of the participants on the scheme. I've got no doubt we need to improve the operation of what's called supported independent living packages. These are packages of 724 care which allow people to live independently and not in institutions. But we've got to make sure that that's actually achieving the promises that we said it would achieve. And I'm absolutely committed to eliminating this double price rule which seems to exist where if you front up and say I'm on the NDIS you get charged more than if you said you weren't on the NDIS. And so to clarify, is eligibility for the scheme being looked at? Well, when you say eligibility, that sort of scares people. Oh, well, I think we need to clarify eligibility. I think we need to make sure the planners are making consistent decisions. As you've covered through your own remarkable investigative journalism over the journey of the NDIS, you could have people in the same family getting radically different results. You can have people in two different locations getting radically different results. Whilst it's an individual scheme, what people want is consistency and predictability. What people on the scheme and people with disability generally, I think, deserve is a doctrine, let's not surprise people. Let's just be straight with people. What are the rules? How does it work? So I think it's a clarification. I'm not interested in some mass headhunting of people. Uh, and I don't labour under the misapprehension that my predecessors did that there's tens of thousands of people on the scheme who shouldn't be. I do think that we've got two rounds of reform or improvement. One is to make sure that the federal agency is working properly, accountably, humanely, empathetically, consistently, transparently. I also think we can eliminate there is the low-hanging fruit of waste, over-servicing, some fraud, some price gouging. And I know that because people with disability write to me every day. And then I think that uh, the review which is coming down in October needs to make sure that we're clear about eligibility, what the rules are, and that we need to also make sure that everything we do is based on the best possible evidence, not uh, on scientific propositions which don't help participants. You have said that the NDIS is being seen at the moment as the only lifeboat in the ocean. What are you doing to change that? The states are important partners in the delivery of disability services in Australia. So we're talking about what they're doing, what they think uh, they'd like to do more of. So it's about building the system outside of the NDIS. I also want to be very clear that this is not just a job for the taxpayer. I really want to encourage business in Australia to start thinking more creatively, not look at it as a person with a disability as too hard to employ, but rather an opportunity. 
And one of the things which is a small example of what I'm talking about is the Labor government, the federal Labor government, took a policy to the last election to help co-sponsor changing places. These are uh, large purpose-built disability toilets and changing rooms so that people with disability can actually get out of their home and visit places but still be able to go to the toilet, something as basic as that. So we're going to work with councils and state governments on where we can put in another 400 of these changing places. But why on earth does the private sector need a government handout to make their facilities user-friendly? So I think there's a lot more we can do. What are your hopes for the future of the scheme? I hope that we can come to a day where people uh, are not talking about it as a financial bin fire, because it's not. So success to me looks like 80-year-old carers at midnight wondering what's going to happen to their adult, profoundly disabled child. Do they no longer have that midnight anxiety? Success to me is lifting the number of people with disability uh, in employment, in parliament, in the media. It's to me making sure that kids can get a proper education without their parents feeling like being made to feel like bullies because they just want their kids to get a fair go. It's about carers being able to contemplate a life, perhaps pursuing a, a vocation in disability, not just in their own family. It's, it's about just treating people the same as we would want someone to treat a member of our family. Minister Bill Shorten, thank you very much for your time. Lovely chatting. As we've heard from Bill Shorten, the NDIS has been life-changing for many participants, but it's also had its challenges. To discuss the scheme, we're joined from Brisbane by disability rights campaigner and disabled woman Ellie Demarchelier, and from Sydney by Damien Griffiths. He is the CEO of the First Peoples Disability Network and a descendant of the Waramai people. Both of you, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Ellie, we'll start with you. You live with cerebral palsy and you're a wheelchair user, but you've also been a long time NDIS participant. Tell us a little bit about your experience prior to being on the scheme. Well, prior to being on the scheme for 27 years, I didn't receive a single dollar of disability support. And that's because uh, it was a very fragmented state-based system that meant uh, there was only so much money that the state gave to disability and once it ran out, it didn't matter if there was 20,000 people that still needed support, you just didn't get support. And what about now that you've been on the scheme? What's your life like now? Look, my life has a lot more choice and independence to it. I, I have two wonderful support workers who come in every day and it's my choice what they do but they help me with things as basic as you know showering and clothing and eating and cleaning just going out to see friends or um, getting out there to medical appointments um, it means that I am working I am healthier I am contributing to society my family are working um, it has been transformative I have gotten the equipment I need in order to be able to contribute back to society but it also means you know I hire two people who have families who also um, contribute to the economy I um, spend money in the economy on equipment and on physios and exercise physiologists and other things um, it has actually created a community uh, where people are um, invested in helping people with disability. Damien, let's go to you now. You work with First Nations people. What's the NDIS meant for First Nations people? Well, it's no doubt now as there has been some First Nations people with disability in their families that have benefited from the scheme and it's certainly important to acknowledge that. But we would say that's more an exception than the rule. The fact remains that we would say there are at least 60,000 First Nations people with disability who are potentially eligible for the scheme and we're nowhere near that number really in terms of participants and that's especially the case in regional remote Australia where there are major barriers for many First Nations people with disability in accessing the NDIS. What are some of those major barriers in regional and remote Australia? Well, there's a number now. One of the most important things to recognise that a market-driven approach is frankly a bit of a nonsense in regional remote Australia. The economies of scale just aren't there. Um, so what we need to invest in more is a community-based response, community-led response, so that community members can support their own community members with disability the way things always were. 
There's also very significant barriers in, in terms of getting access to assessments. Uh, the intake process is very challenging for many First Nations people with disability in their families. There's a lot of risk attached with um, sharing a lot about your family situation or an individual situation with government authorities. A lot of First Nations families don't have great experiences of engaging with government historically. Ellie, from your perspective, what's disappointed you about the scheme? Look, even as a very privileged, resource, knowledgeable person, I've had to fight the NDIS many times just for the basic things that I need in order to get by. Um, so if I have to fight the NDIS and struggle to do that, I can, I've know from speaking to people in the disability community that there are many challenges. Uh, there's challenges around access, as Damien was talking about. Um, their access is too complicated, bureaucratic and expensive to get reports. Uh, there's problems around planning. Planning is too inconsistent and it's not individualised enough with, um, to meet people's needs. And then as Damien pointed to, yes, absolutely, it's at its worst in First Nations communities, but the market-driven approach doesn't work for everyone and, and everything. And it's leaving some people vulnerable to being uh, taken advantage of. And I think in some ways, the NDIS has become a bit like the wedding industry. As soon as you mention NDIS, it becomes 20% more expensive. Uh, and that's taking services away from people with disability and their plans. Damien, are we seeing the same sorts of things for Indigenous people with disability or is it a case of the services just aren't there in the first place? Well, I absolutely agree with all the points that Ellie's made, but the reality is in, in significant parts of regional remote Australia, the services simply don't exist. But we would say that it's not necessarily about services being the, the way to go. It's more about investing in communities. One of the great things that we have in our communities is we have a workforce. There are people already that are providing informal supports to community members with disability, they should be recognised and valued for that. Uh, if we have a community-based response where community members support their own community members with disability, that's the way things are always done. So it's about returning to the old ways in many, in many ways. Damien, what do you want to see changed for the NDIS in the future? Well, there's some recent positive developments that we certainly want to acknowledge. The, the formal establishment of a First Nations Advisory Council uh, which I co-chair with the CEO of the NDIA is long overdue, but we welcome its establishment. There are a number of First Nations people with disability from around the country that are on that advisory council. That needs to have authority. It needs to have a direct line to the FPDN board and needs to have the power to uh, make the recommendations that are so desperately needed. Um, also, the recent appointment of a First Nations person with disability onto the board, that's also another positive development. But having said all those things, it's only going to be effective if it's actually got an opportunity to make meaningful change, to actually action advice that the First Nations Advisory Council will give, and frankly, to get on with the work that's long overdue to supporting a community-led response to disability in our communities. Ellie, what would you like to see changed? Oh, look, um, there's so many places to you could see change happen. Um, first and foremost, I want to make sure that any changes are happening in co-design with people with disability. I know so many people with disability that are engaging with this NDIS review and have so much hope in this NDIS review. I hope that any changes that are uh, taken from the review are implemented in co-design with people with disability. I think housing is an area where there is so much innovation that could be done at the moment. Um, you know, NDIS funds have really been used to transfer state uh, group homes into fancier, flashier, nicer group homes under the NDIS. And we want to see people with disability given more choice about where they live, who they live with and who delivers their support. But also we need to remember that people with disability live 
lots of different types of lives. Some uh, actually have families and pets and um, actually need different types of housing support. So how do we deliver housing in innovative ways, which actually could be more efficient and actually save us money in the end? So housing is a big area where I think the NDIS is currently spending a lot of money uh, instilling the segregated response, which the Disability Royal Commission highlighted as being uh, a place where, you know, d people with disability are at a higher risk of violence, abuse and neglect. And they're certainly isolated from the world in a group home setting. So we really need to see housing um, taken up and a big change there. Ellie de Marchelier and Damien Griffiths, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thanks, Naz. Thank you, Naz. Well, the National Disability Insurance Agency is the organisation that runs the NDIS. It provides support and information to hundreds of thousands of participants. And 2022 marked a significant milestone when for the first time a person with disability was appointed to lead the organisation. I'm joined now by the chair of the NDIA, Kurt Fernley. Kurt Fernley, thank you very much for joining us. When you were appointed chair of the NDIA, the National Disability Insurance Agency, you said that you wanted to stop, take a breath and get to know the organisation. What have you learnt in the first eight months of your role? So the last eight months actually getting to know the people that have been in the, the engine of the NDIS and getting to know how committed they are to the workforce, how there is a deep understanding of the importance of getting this, this agency and this scheme to be really working for people with disabilities, a, a level of commitment and understanding of also the, the experience of disability and also the power that, that this agency has, which is incredible, right? Like it gets to change the lives of hundreds of thousands of Australians Australians on a day-to-day -day basis. Take me back to the time when the NDIS was first rolled out. What was that like for you as a person with lived experience? I had the incredible experience to be able to be a part of the Independent Advisory Council. Uh, we got to travel around this country and, and meet with our future participants to talk about the very real reality that was facing our community. When you experience the lives of people with disabilities before we are where we are now, when you were hearing stories about a, a kid being funded one catheter a day to go to the toilet, and should you require more than once a day, you either needed the funds to adjust or you reuse what was a disposable experience, which, which would then put you at greater risk of infection. It then uh, make you link your experience as a, as a person with a disability to being, being sick, which would then lead you into this inescapable health system. Um, we, would, we would talk to participants or people with disabilities who, who were, the, the, the very real reality was that they were getting a shower once a week. You know, how do you engage with community when you don't have the dignity of feeling clean? There was a huge amount of excitement about what this could mean in defining a person's life around choice and control, rather than a block-funded system that defines your life in these, you know, in these in these small cages and didn't allow you the ability to 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 ask for more. Trust was arguably broken between the disability community and the previous government over independent assessments and that plan really would have changed the way people were assessed for the scheme and ongoing funding determined. Earlier this year, a growth target of 8% was announced to help rein in the costs of the scheme and many think that an announcement came quite premature given the review hasn't been handed down yet. Is there still a trust problem? Look, I think that well, the, the target of 8% and uh, I think any conversation around a, a, a cap, I don't think, well, firstly, I don't think that was particularly legal <laughs> because we operate underneath the NDIS Act and this is a demand driven scheme. Um, I think the 8% the, the target is a good way to, to uh, just be, start being predictable to the community and to government. The Minister has said that the scheme has lost its way and needs a reboot. What's your assessment of the current situation? Reform is needed and I think that the board and executive that's in play with the, the, the Minister who is extraordinarily connected and, and committed to making this scheme, scheme work, to making it be better. When you look back, there are common elements where we need to, we need to also have the person with a disability along on the journey.
And, and I, I, I should point out that the Minister has appointed half of the board are people with disabilities. We've got over 30% of the senior leadership team being those with lived experience of, of, of living as a person with a disability. Uh, and the, the, the percentage of, of the overall workforce, above 20%, you know, like, so we need to continue that pathway because this, this agency was built by the, the lobbying and hard work and the, the, the community of, of people with disabilities in their families demanding justice, uh, demanding a better life for themselves and their children. Uh, and, and I think that if that is the case, we were born out of community, I think that it's only a reasonable ask to ensure that we have people with disabilities inside the agency who are bringing that conversation to every single level. Um, and, and we do need reform so that when people enter into this scheme, they have a, have a fairer and also a, 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 a more predictable experience. What are your hopes for the future of the scheme? If I could hope for one thing is that, is that we, we are truly listening to community. My hope is that this scheme, and uh, you know, as the first person with a disability to be in this role as, as, as chair, you wanna make sure that you're not the last person with a disability in this role. Uh, I, I hope that we are able to head down a pathway that community really understand what seems to be the base level knowledge of the community of people with disabilities, that, that our voice needs to be heard. And when we are heard, we are able to make the experience of those around us and the experience of, of those in the, in the greater community better. Kurt Fairley, thank you very much for joining us. No problems. As we've discussed, hearing from and listening to those with lived experience of the NDIS is key to ensuring it's fit for purpose and that it serves the needs of those who access it. Reporter Charles Bryce spent some time with two people for whom the NDIS has been life-changing. You gotta do it, Charles. During the morning rush, Crystal Matthews prepares for a busy day ahead. Do you want smiley fruits with your cheese? Yeah. She's joined by her four-year-old daughter Zara and support worker Mel. You're gonna have your yoga in here. Crystal lives with cerebral palsy and it's only been in recent years that she's been able to receive in-home support. So I've been able to realise how much easier my life can be if I just have a bit of support around the house and I can really kind of focus on the things that are most important to me. The NDIS has completely changed my life, probably in every aspect. Just five years ago, all of her equipment and therapies were self-funded. Yeah. Now on the NDIS, she has a level of independence she never thought possible. I was able to get the supports that I need, and then on top of that, I was able to get the, this equipment that really allowed me to kind of get out more into the community. Now with a walker and a wheelchair, her family is able to enjoy a quality of life most people take for granted. I'm able to go to the park, with my family, I'm able to go on hikes and things like that, so it's been incredible. My personal favourite Christmas one is this one. The NDIS doesn't just support people with physical disabilities. Yes. Ben, who has Down syndrome, is also part of the scheme. I love all of the funding and everything that the NDIS does so to actually help me with all of my achievements that I've been doing. His list of achievements is long, interning at a commercial radio station and even creating a clothing label. Now I have uh, someone that helps me with PR and public relations and uh, getting to know more internships everywhere I go. I'm very thankful for that. For Mum Sam, having been on the NDIS has been life-changing. I think if you'd asked me 10 years ago, would Ben be able to catch a bus into town on his own, meet up with his friends, go and have a beer at the pub, and then come home later on an Uber, I would have thought you were dreaming. But the NDIS has made that a reality. During this program, we've looked at the NDIS and how it's evolved over the past 10 years. But we also want to look to the future. We want to hear from you, the participants, families, workers and providers. We know the NDIS has been life changing, but we also want to know what's wrong with the scheme. And we want to hear from you about how to fix it. 
You can share your stories with us by heading to abc.net.au slash NDIS. Thanks for your company on NDIS 10 Years. I'm Naz Campanella. Bye for now.